Maccabees TV, and we here once again with my brother, Moray Yeshaya, a.k.a. Kashub Danite. All right, we're here. We're doing something a little bit different than we normally do. Now, there's a lot of scholars and a lot of Israelites within the community. There's a lot of Israelite brothers in the community that are actually authors, and they're putting out publications. And I just wanted to spotlight this particular brother because this brother has written two books that maybe some of the people that's watching this video are not aware of. And I've seen the books. And let me tell you, the books are well worth the price because the information in there is potent, man. So, brother, um, real quick, just introduce yourself for the one or two people that's watching that don't know you. And then we can get right into the uh, main portion of this video. Do it all in prayers to the creator and the main of heaven and earth. My name is Yeshaya Yisrael, coming out of Kosheri, through Ashaba, through many Adat, giving much respect to the chief prince of poor. Out of the congregation, Shema Yisrael, it's not base. Those who know what it is, know what it is. Um, giving a shout out on the human level to my brothers from the AOC, from the lines of Israel, my brother Daniela, my man's Pawar, as well as my good dear friend Sha'al. So just want to give a shout out in that particular case, in that particular aspect real quick. Okay, no doubt, no doubt. So listen, man, um, you just put out a publication, a book. And uh, the response from the people that I saw that have purchased the book have all been rave reviews. So I want you to speak a little bit about the publication that you recently put out. What is the name of the book? Uh, why did you write it? And uh, what do you want people to get from it? I, once again, give it honor and praise to the creator and the main of heaven and earth. The name of the book is entitled Egypt Talk and Writing. Did the Torah come from the culture of Tomeri? That's the name of the book. Now, let me explain the content of the book. You understand? This is it right here. It says, Egypt talk and writing. Did the Torah come from the culture of Tomeri? Now, before I tell people how to get it, let me explain the fundamental reasoning of it. Egypt talk basically is, it was actually a speech that was put in the writing. The writing wound up coming out to be 14 pages, eight and a half by 11, only written basically on one side. You understand? In writing, as you may see, this is more than just that. It expanded as time went on. Now, the subtitle is actually a question. Did the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, come from the culture of Tomeri? Tomeri is the northern part of Egypt. You understand what they call Lower Egypt, where they say that the Israelites would have been settled and where they were supposedly been taught inside the military schools and so forth and so on. According to some people's concept of doctrine, there is saying up there that the Israelites was taught about the ways of being a certain kind of culture from the Egyptians. Dr. Ben implied that. Dr. Clark taught that. Oslo Crazy still goes around teaching that. You got people, no offense intended, like Sarah City, still going around saying that. So all of these different people, some of them are still among us, some of them have passed away, you understand, have actually imbibed the idea that the scriptures, namely the Torah, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, came out of the culture of Tomeri. Meanwhile, they don't acknowledge the fact that the ancient Egyptian priests were bold. The ancient Israelite priests were told not to be bold. As pointed out in the book of Ezekiel 44, 19 and verse 20, and Leviticus chapter 21, verse 1, and also verse 5. It talks about how Yisrael, or the children of Yisrael, or Israel, had a diet. Having a diet means that you had a particular <clears throat> form of what you ate and what you did not eat. Principles of Ma'at doesn't have a diet. Tonight begins the Shabbat. They don't have no Shabbat in the culture of Ma'at. They didn't have a Pesach, or a Pasach, or a Passover. So you're going to have to basically go into Egyptian culture itself, unbiased, unadulterated, Kemetic, Semitawi culture and sit there and break it down. Let me explain what Semitawi is. Tawi in ancient Egyptian means two lands. Sema means unity. Semitawi means the unity of the two lands. So to unite is a verb. They were the people of Semitawi. So all of the people disrespecting, talking about, well, how can you be a Hebrew when it's a verb? How can you be the people of the United Lands when unite means a verb? You understand? Tashmehu, Deshret, each Tawi, Hutare, all of these different lands outside of ancient Egypt had verbs to it, had an action to it. There's a reason why they named their particular land that. So you're going to have to sit back there and explain how you're going to try to use the word abar, which in Hebrew means to cross over, also meaning the word past, P-A-S-T. You're going to have to sit back there and explain how is it that you're going to say, oh, if people can't be that. Because it would have been a language, but there's a language called Spanish, but there's people Spanish. There's a language called French, and there's people who's French. You only come at that with the house of Israel. Let me explain something to these characters out there who follow Israel Maccabees TV on the Basim show. Shout out to my friend Basim and everything else. 
Let me explain something to the individuals who want to sit there and follow the house of Israel. Oh, Shalak Ami. Let my people go. Stop sitting up there and sweating the children of Israel because you need to sit there and have some kind of clout and play for yourself. Keep our names out your mouth, please. Because um, the only reason why we was talking about y'all because y'all was talking about us. So that's something to be known and understood. See, I'm 36, blessed be the father. Been in the knowledge of Israel since I was two years old. So this is all I knew. All I knew was the Tanakh. You understand what I'm saying? All I knew was the stories about David. All I knew was about the stories of Moses. All I knew was about the stories of Noah. You understand what I'm saying? So now by the time I'm 15, 16 years old, I'm already up there in Hashabah Yisrael reading the Hebrew. You understand? When they used to call us up, we used to say, Mode Ani Lefaneka Meleka Wakwayam Sheke Zarata Bi Nishmati Wakeme Rabba Imunateka. I give thanks unto thee, O compassionate king. Great is thy faithfulness who has bestowed upon us our breath. You understand? I remember saying that as a little kid. You understand? So just using that as an example, where were y'all at when these camps was around, man? Where were y'all at when Hashabu was there, when Kosheri was there, when Benaya Dot was there, and so forth and so on? If you come from one west, where was y'all at when they was all united? Who set y'all individuals up after all of these camps winded up splitting to try to sit there and be a thorn in Israel's side when you're not teaching the land, language, and cultures of our people? Who are we? What is our land, language, and culture? We say Hebrews and language. The land is in the east. Incorrectly today called Palestine. You can thank Adrian for that. And the culture is the Torah. As I explained to people on the South Showtime show, I had to ask a person that's into these comedic sciences, what is the litmus or what is the balance that you sit there and have for yourself? If somebody would say, those people <clears> here, <throat> you're like for eating shrimp, I would sit there and say, well, they were going against the culture because the culture teaches us not to eat any sea creatures that don't have fins and scales. But what is your litmus? What is your balance to say what is right and what is wrong? When you read in the principles of my eye, I have not worked evil. What is evil? I have not sinned. When you go even in the New Testament, correct me if I'm wrong, in 1 John, it says a sin is a transgression of the law. The law is speaking of is the law of the Most High. So there's already a balance that has already been set. Where is your balance at? What have you set as the mark? Because you're just dealing with the science of somebody else. Now, a lot of people may sit there and say, oh, it just looks like you're trying to hate on Egypt and bang on Egypt and so forth. We're not banging on Egypt. What we're doing, brothers and sisters, is trying to eradicate the Illuminati created New Age Kemet. This New Age Kemet says that Hapsetsit was the first great ruler. Meanwhile, Sobek Nefru, which I point out in this book here, is actually the woman that was by the Nile that took Moshe. That's a whole other story. I ain't going to ruin it. Let's get into the book for those who want to get into it. She ruled in Dynasty 12. So how does that come out to be? Why is it that you don't find the tomb of Amenahat the fourth? Why don't you find the tomb of Dudimos, of Neferhotep? Why don't you find the tomb of what, if I'm not, if I stand to be corrected, Ramses the eighth? You understand? There are certain tombs of these certain people that's been noted that has not been found. So just want to sit there and let that be noted. So when you're trying to sit there and state, um, where are the tombs of the ancient Israelites? You have a European-based man's concept because they deal with the Tomb Raider. In the school I teach in, I had to ask the students in there, is there a game called Tomb Raider? And they said, yeah, it's a, it's a video game. But they go in there and they go in and violate somebody else's deceased. I'm like, that's kind of sick and morbid, don't you think? It's kind of um, um, wicked, you know, but you come right down into it. Um, I wouldn't want to sit there and be that around that kind of energy, you know. So we teach, let the dead bury the dead and let the dead rest in peace. We're not about sitting up there trying to dig up the dead and so forth and so on. That's, that's not really our thing. You understand? I have a book entitled 100 Years of Lynchings by Ralph Ginsburg. And in that book, they talked about how they used to sit there and hang black men and cut their ears off, their penises off, cut their eyes out, smell their spleen, their stomach and their intestines and everything like that. Well, y'all people up there in this so-called comedic assault society praising the fact that they went into the dead of X, Y, and Z, y'all are allowing them regardless of Shemite or Hamite, to sit there and desecrate the body of a dead black man. Something's wrong with that. Y'all out your mind. So, just want to sit there, just want to let that be known and understood. It might seem debatable, but these are just hardcore what it is. This book right here you can get on Amazon. The price is 1650 You understand? I didn't want to sit there and charge over 20 25 like some of my friends and 
so forth to the set or the same because we are not the richest as a people in bills and children in school. So I didn't want to sit there and, you know, charge twenty twenty five dollars <throat> The way to get in contact is kashubhut at gmail.com. I'll spell it. K-A-S-H-U-B-H-U-T at gmail.com. The ISBN number 978-153-088-1918. So for those who are interested, as far as that's concerned, if you want to reach me directly, the contact number is 908-587-4841. That's my business phone for those who want to reach me, 908-587-4841, for those who are interested in contacting me concerning this. To the brothers and sisters and the elders who bought it, I say thank you for the patronage. I'm open to constructive criticism. Let me know what you think about it and so forth. I want to read with the little bit of time allotted. Part of this. <clears throat> now, this is on page 150. No, pardon me, 165. Now, I'm hoping it shows clear inside of the video. I want to sit there and get into this. You look at this right here. This is the Hebrew word Amen. And this is the Egyptian Enmen. If you look very carefully, reading it from the left to the right. Yep, left to the right. There is no A, because there is no syllable for A. So how did Amen, because this is the symbol of the Egyptian A, how did Amen in Hebrew become from Amen in Egyptian when this is not an A sound? This is an I, this is the M-N, and this is the N. This is the double letter. This symbol right here shows it to be a male. This is Amen, or Imen, not Amen. So where's the A at, the little vulture thing that would have made that? Because when you speak about Ra, they spell that with the little A right there. You understand? So how is that supposedly been correct? So as pointed out, it says Hebrew is always, unlike Egyptian, read from right to left. The Hebrew from right to left is Amen. The root of the word is Aman, and it means to agree. Right? Now, they say that Imen inside the Egyptian means the word hidden. Hidden in Hebrew is the word, two words, sold, secret or hidden, or the word sater, which means secret or hidden. You understand? So just want to sit there and let that be noted for edification purposes. How do you say to agree inside of Egyptian? Let me know if you're able to find out. Because you got to sit there and show either in the English translation, because you can't show it from the Hebrew, exactly what that's talking about. Next, we want to go, giving you a cheat sheet into this book. They want to say that Yah is a moon god of Egypt. But this is how Yah is spelt inside the ancient Hebrew. Or pardon me, in Hebrew. This is Ayah inside of ancient Egyptian. See, this would have been the two flax and reed to make the Y. But in the moon god Aya of ancient Egypt, you just see the one. So this is not Y, like the Yod in Hebrew represents Y. This is just I. See, this is coming from the actual Egyptian writing. And then this book is discussed on page 166. So I just want to show those two things there, <clears throat> just to sit there and let it be known and understood. The scriptures did not come out of Egypt. Yah is not a moon god of Egypt. It is not Amen inside of ancient Egyptian phonetics. You understand? We just want to go over certain things like that. In this book, I go over the Imperial Papyrus, the Brooklyn Papyrus, the Ebers Papyrus. Now, I did not show any of the graphic pictures that we spoke about before Maccabees TV, because my little one may see this. Other children may dig on their parents' shelf and pull it down, and I don't want that to be the memory to be noted from an Israelite. If brothers were to come and chill where I'm staying at, and there's a phoenix on the wall, nigga, you got a lot of explaining to do. I, what the, is that? Well, it's the, the science of what? See, it's what you don't understand. The Hebrews don't understand as if we ain't got kids and we ain't been with women. So you're right. It's, um, it's the resurrection. <clears throat> There's a difference, nasty, between resurrection and erection. Now, who created that men and my end story? Who etched it in the wall? Who said this metronet is going to write and say the goddesses said this is your perfection? Was it a man who made it or a woman? Because when you even watch the silly comedy by Queens of Comedy, where some more comedian, the female is just talking about men's phalluses the same way men talk about women's vaginas. She's a woman, so it may seem a bit whorish, but women can understand where women are coming from. What creature made that on those walls and the walls of Kemet, man? Why do you find 
the wife of Thutmose II, who was upset to a married woman in male regalia running after men's phallus in the race, on side the walls of Karnak. How do you explain a married woman running toward another man's phallus symbol? How do you explain Happy's breasts? And by the way, when you go to Isaiah 60 about sucking on the breast of kings, I explain what that is within here. See, what I did, bless be the Father, is go into a lot of the different quotes that I've seen online, offline, in videos. And I was so crazy. If you watch this, stop teaching Leviticus 21.18. It's saying about the priest with the flat nose. Saying that Yah or Yahweh must be a god of the white man because having a flat nose like a black person means that you curse. No. The word in Hebrew is karom. From the Hebrew word karam or karma, which means anything that is disfigured. When Moses spoke about the Israelites, he said Israel got beat down to Kodama in the book of Deuteronomy. Kodama in Hebrew means utter destruction. So when you read in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 18, the mistranslation says flat nose. The Hebrew says anything that is disfigured. All of that is pointed out in this book right here. So they need to sit there and try to sit there and just stop with their games, stop with their falsehoods, because you can't go and say 1.0, it came out of Egypt. Then you want to turn around and say, oh, it came from the white man. <clears throat> One person said the Torah could never have been written about Moses because that was written about in the um, 8th century BCE. So you're talking about the 700 something when the Syria was still doing their thing. So how, if such is the case, did it come from the white man? Who were the people that was allowed to go inside of Egypt, to go in their walls, to sit there and get this knowledge that eventually became the Torah? Why does Egypt have a 10-day week and the ancient Hebrews have a 7-day week? Why and what is the death penalties or capital punishment inside of ancient Egypt? Bowing down to another god in the Torah, that's capital punishment. Sleeping with somebody of the same gender, that's a capital punishment in Israel. Sleeping with another man's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, that's capital punishment in Israel. You understand? There are certain things slapping your moms or your pops, that is capital punishment in Israel. Now, when they try to say, well, they had war captives, they didn't have slaves. If you kidnap a man, right, <clears throat> and treat him as a slave in the book of Exodus, that is a death penalty. So we have to begin knowing and understand that certain things in Torah, not saying that we are perfect, but certain things hold certain things of punishments and weights. The village part of me, Proverbs says, a just weight and a just balance is the um, desire of the Most High. So what then is the weight scaled on inside of that? Well, Atta Ashby in his book that I point out in here, stated in his book, Gods and Goddesses of Ancient Egypt, Volume 2, that ancient Egypt has so many different gods that he could not sit there and mention them all. Well, those are not really gods. See, those are creative forces. And you got to understand that. See, the Hebrews, LOL, don't understand that. So why is Kadesh of Babylon inside of the Egyptian pantheon? Why is Baal of Canaan inside the Egyptian pantheon? Do y'all not have enough gods of your own that you got to sit there and borrow the gods of Canaan? That you got to sit there and take somebody else's and then make it into an Egyptian form? Like, no offense intended, I love my people from the islands, but reggae fell when y'all took American R&B and started putting a beat to it. Y'all should have stayed with Shaba, you should have stayed with Cutting Ranks, and should have stayed with the other ones. When y'all started doing that, and my brothers and sisters from the islands in Jamaica making American R&B reggae, some of it is hot, don't get me wrong, I'm not even an artist or a singer, but it kind of diluted their own particular uniqueness. Now, let me speak about uniqueness, because they want to sit there and jump all over the place talking about Africa, Kemet, Kemet, Africa, and so forth and so on. The young Africans. How do you explain Kamos and what he said about the Val Nubian when he was one of the kings, man? When you go into a book, Egypt, Canaan, and Israel in ancient times by, um, when I, um, by Radford, that's the guy's name, he spoke about that, about Kamos of Dynasty 17, the son of Sennacare, the brother of Amos, and he said that the Ethiopian or the Nubian, that is to say, is the vile person as well as the Asiatic. So where was their African pride in their kings? Why do you have the Sinna 8 and the Sinna 16 wall in Dynasty 12, also mentioned in this book, talking about Ethiopians as captives? Why does the Palermo inscription speak of such? And now, in concluding out, in part, y'all dudes got the same spirit that the white man got towards slavery. Why do I say that? Moses killed the man and ran away. That's not what happened. See, what happened is Moses killed the man who was beating on his brother. And then when Moses tried to sit there and 
um, mediate between two Israelites fighting, one of the Kums said, you want to kill me like you killed an Egyptian? What he was saying was, you want to kill me like you killed my son. So he said, oh, this thing is known. I now must flee. He was running, not from the Egyptians, as much as he was running from the Kum Israelites who would have turned him in. And that's how Pharaoh wound up finding out because somebody decided to sit there and talk. You understand? The Uncle Tom's, if you might say so. No offense to Josiah Henson. Get in your black history, you know what I'm talking about. So, y'all talking up against Moshe or Moses, oh, he just killed the man and ran. Y'all have the same mentality that European people talk about Nat Turner. Oh, they just killed the babies and they just killed people. You forgot Nat Turner's family was sold. You forgot Moses was raised in the palace of Egypt. Where's his pops at? Was he fatherless? Was he raised without no dad? You forgot about that part. Where was his mom at? His mom had him to a certain age, and then she just like in slavery. When you even if you watch the later movie about um post slavery, like in the mythological but yet reality book, The Color Purple. Okay, here's my children. I give my children off to you, and so forth and so on. So it just goes to show that's exactly the similar thing that happened. You understand? If this science of ancient Egypt was supposed to have been so great. Why did it not work for their people? Well, why didn't the Torah work? The Torah did work. See, the way of the Most High is straight. It's good for the righteous and it's destruction to the workers of iniquity. So it's going to work, whether it's in your favor or not. It's the yay, zay, yay, nay. See, we are to not teachers. We sit up there. One of the things we teach in the school we come from, we call it in Leviticus 26, the it's been factor. To not go know exactly where I'm coming from. We've been teaching that for decades. If you keep my law, then this. If you don't, then this. We call it the if then. See, that's how the Most High came and speaking, keeping it 100 in layman terms with the house of Israel. You don't get 100 in my eye. You don't get so um, I have one question before we go, because we hear this a lot. So we can just answer this really briefly, because there's no really need to go too deep with it, right? What do you say to people who say, why are you writing books? We already have the book, the Bible. We don't need any more books. You know, I hear that and see that a lot. What do you say to that? First off, I know in the scriptures, and it's not to add to the word, it says, in the writing of many books, there's no end and much studies of weariness of the flesh. That is a fact. Now, there are Israelites, Hebrews, if you may, that may say such. And not to sound disrespectful or anything of that sort, every book is not made for everybody. If it's for you, if it helps you, so be it. If it's not for you, if you're not heavy into the history, so be it. Some of the critics who are Israelites concerning my book have told me basically things like, well, um, keep the law, brother. And I'm not teaching to not keep the law. Well, what does that have to do with keeping the law, brother? I'm going to explain one scripture in the Bible that goes into that. Deuteronomy chapter 5, which reiterates the Ten Commandments. It says, remember and observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And you shall remember that thou was a servant in the land of Egypt. See, that's connected right there in Deuteronomy 5. So you can't sit there and separate that kind of teaching. Right. So it's all inconclusive. But that's what I got to say about it. Right. That. And, you know, I always say really quickly, for somebody that says that we don't need to go into books, I want to see them within just the scriptures. I want you to break down Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and Daniel 11 with just precepts and no history books. Because we use names. When we start breaking down Daniel 11, we're giving names. We're talking about Antiochus. We're talking about Ptolemy. We're talking about this one. That's not in the Bible. So where do you get those names to associate to the scriptures? You get them from books. So it's really a stupid argument, but I just thought I would ask you. Now, before I let you go, you know, you wrote, this is not your first book that you wrote, but definitely this is the best book that you wrote. You are an author of other books. And so the people should know that when they reach out to you, if they're interested in your other books, they'll, they'll be available as well. Okay. This is another one real quick that he's about to pull out. This one here, part of the cover, it was called Deuteronomy 28, 15, and 68, The Condition of the Blacks. Now, this one right here in my left hand is available on Amazon as well as Create Space. All right. I already gave the ISB number earlier. This one is available only via by email in PDF format. So for those who want my email again... K-A-S-H-U-B-H-U-T at gmail.com. That's kashubhut at gmail.com. And I can PDF this to you. This gets into the aspect of why we say Deuteronomy 28 is in relation to us. What we teach about it. Why do we say Deuteronomy 2868 is concerning the Atlantic slave trade? Connecting that to Isaiah 60 and so forth and so on. Why do we teach Deuteronomy 28 
verse 26 as well as verse 25 has mistranslations about being um, removed to all the kingdoms when it actually says a horror to all the kingdoms. What does Deuteronomy 28 mean when it says you shall be destroyed from the root word shamad, which means to be devastated, unlike the word gawa, which means to perish or to be in destruction. So just want to sit there and just point these couple of things out within this book in part right here. This gets into the Israelites in the Roman Empire, Israelites under Islam, Israelites in Yathrib and Saudi Arabia, giving much respect to Buddha Winslow, I cite him periodically in this. This also gets into the Israelites in the medieval Persian Empire, the situation with Cyrus, situation with Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, situation before that, Tiglath Pelesar. We also, in this particular book, speak a little bit about the Exodus, but not too much. But the bulk of this talks about the black man, woman, and child in the Western Hemisphere. We're not saying that there are no Israelites in the other parts of the world, but no offense intended. And for the people who say, oh, the Israelites hate Africa. The Israelites scattered throughout the other parts of the world are not talking about our brothers in Flatbush. They're not talking about our brothers in the South Bronx. They're not talking about our brothers in Compton because they got their own unfortunate issues they're dealing with. Well, the black man in the Western Hemisphere has his own issues we're dealing with. So we're not saying that Israelites don't exist in other places. We just unfortunately need to focus immediately on us. All right, so I just want that to be noted for reason and purposes. So in concluding, this book right here in my left hand, Egypt Talking Writing, Did the Torah Come from the Culture of Tomeri? It's available online right now for $16.50. All right, Amazon as well as CreateSpace. <clears throat> CreateSpace.com is all one word. This, as stated in my right hand, is available via email and PDF format and the information I already stated. Anybody who wants to contact me immediately concerning this, you can call me at 908-587-4841. 908-587-4841. Shalom. Shalom. Good, great job, by the way, brother. Shalom. We'll see y'all family again soon.